There, there's an ad that's been shown on um, Irish television these days, and, and I don't know uh, whether it's been sort of localised uh, around Europe, but it's for Carlsberg. And it's somebody who turns up uh, at his office and um, uh, he's summoned immediately to go and see his boss, so he thinks uh, trouble. Yeah, because he sees people who are sort of, you know, doing things with his door, you know, changing the signs, and he thinks, this is it. You know, I've uh, finally uh, lost my job. Um, and when he goes into the, uh, the office, he meets the, 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 the boss, and the boss says, you've been appointed uh, global entertainment manager. So the last shot is of this man uh, on a beach um, organizing the Christmas party for the members of, of staff. And the slogan is, um, Carlsberg don't do human resources management, but if they did, um, so I feel that uh, sitting here today, uh, Carlsberg don't do translation studies seminars, but if they did, uh, it would look something very much like what we have uh, here uh, this morning. And I'm particularly... Uh, perhaps not, no. <laughs> but uh, just to say how delighted I am uh, to be in this uh, company and the, and the idea that Anthony's had of organizing something uh, like this, which is, is breaking precisely with the kind of, you know, uh, seminar colloquium uh, conference model that one uh, commonly uh, finds. So, so I'm particularly d delighted to be here today, and, and, and thank you, uh, Anthony, for, for, for organizing this. Um, what I want to do um, in the, the time that, that, that I have, and I'll try not to be too long, because you know, I'm conscious of the fact that it's, 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 it's going to be a long uh, morning, is um, I want to talk about um, why I suppose I think sociocultural approaches are important, and to some extent how I came to these uh, a kind of sociocultural approach. And I'd also like to talk about, because one of the things that, that we're looking at is sort of future directions, I mean, this is this what Anthony mentioned in, in his uh, introduction, is, you know, what are the kinds of areas where, you know, I think this kind of research can go and the tasks and the challenges, etc., that we will have to, um, to face. Let me start with the, the first, which is, um, and I want to take you back um, two decades to uh, when, like yourselves, I was uh, doing my uh, PhD work in the, um, the mid-80s. Um, and there was two things, three things. One is I hadn't really a clue about what I wanted to do. Um, I changed the topic uh, seven times. Um, the, <laughs> the second was that uh, I was living on uh, an island um, in which, when I was doing it, uh, 2,500 people had already died in uh, political uh, warfare, um, 20,000 had suffered uh, serious uh, and life-changing uh, injuries. And thirdly, um, I wanted to get off that island as quickly as my legs could uh, take me. And why? Um, what I felt at the time, and this um, links into what uh, Danielle was saying um, at the very end of his extremely interesting presentation, was I felt an extraordinary impatience with what's called identitarian politics. Uh, in other words, the idea that geography was destiny. Um, not only was geography destiny, but one's ethnic affiliation, one's ethnic uh, belonging, um, somehow defined you uh, ad vitam eternam, that you were eternally defined by a point of uh, origin where you, you happened to be, either geographically or uh, ethnically. Um, so that on my own island, um, where there was um, British identity politics and Irish identity politics with um, military forces in the shape of the British Army, uh, paramilitary groups on the British nationalist and Irish nationalist side engaged in shootings, bombings, and, and so on. It seemed to me that this kind of identitarian politics was literally murderous. Right? It was the kind of identitarian politics, of course, that had immobilized Europe for, uh, four, uh, for four years in the, uh, the trenches. And I think the experience of the front is crucial um, to the ways we think about uh, translation studies in all kinds of ways that I'll come back to uh, at the end of, of, of my brief uh, presentation. But of course, 
What often happens, um, and this is what Montaigne says in his essay about uh, Les Cannibales, is that you've got to go uh, a long way often to find out what's happening uh, back home. So my version of going a long way was to go to Quebec. Um, because what I found reading the literature of many Quebec novelists was a lot of things that were exercising uh, the Quebec literary imagination, so questions of uh, belonging, of linguistic identity, of uh, cultural communities, and so on, the kind of the, uh, the relationship, the, the, the fraught relationship with, with English language Canada, and so on, is that by reading this kind of literature, I began to think again about the situation in, in, in my own country and about my own experience growing up with, with Irish Gaelic and, uh, and, and English. But more importantly, is that looking at a certain number of Quebec writers like Gérard Besset and Réjean Ducharme, Jacques Goodbout to some extent, is that I began to see that, that the kind of identitarian politics were breaking down on the pages of these texts. In other words, that what I saw in many of these texts was that the contact with English language culture, with, the, with English language itself, um, the way in which they were looking at the genesis of the French language in, in Quebec, is that increasingly what they were showing was contact rather than opposition. In other words, that it was a, through writing to see if there was a way of going beyond, of, of transcending, of creating some kind of space that went beyond identitarian politics. And one of the ways in which this was done, of course, was through um, the fact of uh, translation. And increasingly then, this area of translation became a way of um, looking at revisiting, again, uh, questions of uh, identity, um, belonging, and, and so on, but in a way that was liberating rather than uh, in, imprisoning. So then in the, um, the mid-80s and, and early 90s, um, when what I see as more interesting strands in, in post-colonial criticism uh, emerge, and people like Salman Rushdie and talk about many migratory uh, movements and peoples in the contemporary setting as kind of translated uh, subjects. Um, this then caused me to reflect back on the experience, again, of Ireland, which I describe in translating Ireland, is what happens when an entire people translate themselves from one language to another? Beginning of the 19th century, three quarters of the Irish population are uh, Irish Gaelic speakers, at the end of the century, 4%. Now, meanwhile, half the population has either uh, died or emigrated. Um, so then, what, how do you then conceive of a notion of uh, identity if you don't take on board the notion of translation? So rather than translation being peripheral to questions of identity, it is in quite, quite, quite central. So this is kind of one, if you like, strand that, that, that's feeding into the, the, the kind of issues um, that, that uh, interested me in developing some kind of sociocultural uh, approach. The second, and this is I'm kind of fast forwarding uh, here, is in the uh, more recent years, um, I was puzzled by the fact that people talked about, you know, the politics of, of, of translation, um, but translation and political uh, change, but translation and its impact on culture. But all the time, there was a kind of assumption that the, the economy basically performed the way it did uh, in Marx's Das Kapital, um, that somehow the economic organization of societies was more or less uh, as it had been uh, since sometime in the late uh, 18th century. Whereas, in fact, if you look at the contemporary settings, and many of the developments that Daniel has described, it seems to me, uh, go back to, uh, to this, is there has been a profound change in the nature of the economy in the last uh, three decades. And it seemed to me absolutely vital and urgent that translation scholars develop an engagement with political uh, economy. To put it quite, quite succinctly and briefly, uh, if you want to increase productivity in an agricultural mode of production, um, you do two things. You acquire more land, 
hence you know, imperial campaigns uh, conquest, and uh, you acquire a greater labor force, hence slavery. Um, if you want to increase production or productivity in the industrial mode of production, you get your hand on cheap sources of, of energy. That's, that's the, so you, you get the coal fields, you get the oil fields. In fact, we're still, you know, there's, there's, there's elements of this today as I, as I speak. Um, but the informational mode of, of production is one that how you increase productivity is through cheap inputs of energy. Um, because you know, when I buy a piece of a software from Microsoft, I'm not paying uh, for you know, the, the bit of plastic or whatever that, uh, that I get in, in the box. What I'm paying for is the information that's contained within the, uh, the software. That's what I'm paying money for. When I pay an outrageous sum of money for the new U2 uh, CD, um, it's, you know, what I'm paying for is not the, the physical object, it's, it's the, the, uh, the informational content of the songs that are on the CD, which I regret to say is depressingly low, um, with the exception of one or two songs. Um, so basically, um, in the, the words of Manuel Castells, the um, sociologist, we have moved to this sort of informational society where um, we're sort of living in an in interconnectedness and what is sort of underpinning this economy is uh, information. But as he says, um, information has been with us since, since the dawn of time. You know, people have always used information. But what informational means is that it is information itself that actually underpins the nature of uh, economic productivity growth and, and so on. So what I began to think about then was, well, if that's the case then, and we live on a multilingual planet. Microsoft now makes 65% of their uh, profits uh, from uh, overseas sales, and the vast majority of those overseas sales are in non-Anglophone uh, countries. Um, the translation industry uh, is currently worth about $6 billion uh, annually. Um, why is this not appearing? Uh, anywhere when we talk about you know, socio-cultural uh, approaches to uh, translation. And this sort of interests me at two levels, if you like. Um, one is the actual industry itself, I mean, translation as, as, as an industry and the way you would describe um, the development of the spread of uh, an industry, um, you, know, you know, why won't we getting more sort of um, critical interpretive approaches to that? And second is the impact of this sort of informationalism and an informational economy on translators themselves, on translators' working uh, lives. Um, so things like the flexibilization of the workforce, the, the shift from the staffed translator, you know, who is part of a firm that they join at 25 and they leave at the age of 65, um, to um, people who are working on short-term uh, contracts in a world of time-space compression where the, no the notion of the actual delivery of the translation itself uh, changes. So this kind of dual aspect to the political economy of translation seemed to me to be absolutely crucial to um, a, mo a more complex notion of how we uh, thought about the socio-cultural. Because it seemed to me, with, without wishing to be sort of necessarily um, reductionist about it, but that it seems strange to have all this talk about the cultural uh, and the political impact of translation and to completely bracket these enormous transformations in the political economy of uh, both uh, developed societies and uh, developing societies. And this brings me on to my um, third point, which is um, to do with one of the, the points that Danielle mentioned was this notion of, of technology and the increasing emphasis on, on particular kinds of technology in, in translation um, research. Um, what struck me very often in discussions around the notion of technology is that, and it struck me most forcibly a number of years ago with colleagues, we, we organized the first software localization conference in, in Dublin because the city at the time had become a kind of a, a center for, for localization. And what struck me is that there was these beautiful PowerPoint demonstrations. I mean, to die for, I mean, there's sort of these wonderful things kind of whizzing around the screen and, you know, little bullet points coming up and, uh, and speaker after well-dressed speaker got up and did all kinds of wonderful things with the PowerPoints. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it was utterly deadening because what we basically got um, 
like much of the literature at the time, was just basically kind of product descriptions. You know, my piece of software does this, it does that, it does that, um, compared to other pieces of software did that and did this and did that. Um, but there was no um, sort of self-reflexive moment in, uh, you know, not much thinking about in, in broader kind of sociocultural terms of what this technology was doing um, to the way we think about uh, translation, uh, translation, translation's impact in society, and how translators uh, saw themselves. So it seemed to me there was a kind of division of labor then in translation studies research, which was you had quite sophisticated um, philosophically uh, and politically informed analyses of literary texts in post-colonial settings on the one hand, and on the other hand, these kind of very linear, uh, quite banal, straightforward product descriptions in the translation technology area. Uh, whereas it seemed to me that um, if one looks at the area of uh, anthropological research, if you look at uh, the work that's been done in the history of science, that the very definition of what it means to be human is bound interact with the object world, um, that our tools, if you like, the tools that we use are a kind of material manifestation um, of uh, what it is to be uh, human. In other words, take a very simple thing like a, I mentioned the globalization book of, of a standing stone, some kind of memorial. Um, what that thing out there, that object does, is to let you know that there there was someone there before you, right? that, you know, and this commemorates that person. And this is the kind of trace or the object mark that they leave behind them, just as when all of us um, here at this uh, symposium uh, this morning will finally vanish into the ether, um, what will be left behind will be you know, what is there on